Okay, go. Uh, this is a patient who has difficulty pooping. Uh, she, when she goes, uh, she, she can't evacuate and she has to splint uh, in order for her to empty her rectum. Um, so the, uh, our motility uh, team got a defecogram, a floral defecogram. Um, so who wants to go? Who wants to take this? Okay, residents. Well, we only have residents, so residents go. What is, all right, so this is, so there's four phases to a defecogram. The first one is just rest. That's the first image you saw, that's rest. And on rest, what, what are you seeing? That's not normal. Oops. So the rectum should not be this low, right? The anus is here. The anorectum, anorectal junction is there. It's it, The rectum should not be below the anorectal jun junction. Okay, so that's not normal. And then the, here's the contrast. This is normal. That we put contrast, or the patients put contrast in their vagina. So it outlines where the vagina is. And then they drink contrast about an hour before we start so that we can opacify the small bowel. So that's the small bowel. So that's fine. That's where it should be. All right. Then the first, the rest, then the next thing you do is squeeze. Yes. Who said that? Yes. Did someone say, okay. So you squeeze. So the squeeze looks normal, right? So the pubal rectalis contracts and it lifts up the rectum and that's normal. So she has normal function there. And then what's the next step after you squeeze? You Valsava. Yeah. So, Sorry, none of us have actually read one of these before. So. Oh, good. I'm happy then. Then you're going to see one now. Um, so you squeeze, then you Valsava. So you ask them to bear down. So it's like if they're, you know, trying to, um, I don't know, what's the word, like, you know, when you're contracting your stomach or or abdomen or whatever. So you ask them to Valsalva. So you Valsalva. So then this is when she Valsalva. This is what happens. So tell me what you see when she Valsalva. And here's a static image of when she Valsalva. So you look like you have a pelvic floor, like, um, I guess, like insufficiency almost, where it's like, yeah. Yes. Pressure Good. Going it's called pelvic end. floor descent. It's called pelvic floor descent. So the the pelvic floor kind of is weak. Um, my colleague calls it saggy baggy. Uh, it's weak. It kind of like drops like a hammock. Okay. What else do you see? Um, it almost looks like there's vaginal prolapse. So this is the vagina. Okay. So then the rectum, the anterior rectum, is pushing on the vagina. So it's pushing, pushing, and so it has a mass effect on the vagina. See that? Yep. So vaginal prolapse is when it comes out, when the vagina comes out. Here, it's not the vagina that's coming out. It's the rectum that pushy, that presses, like has mass effect on the posterior wall of the vagina anteriorly. But the okay, vagina so, itself doesn't descend. Go ahead. Oh, so that um, bottom portion of like the, or like that proximal portion of the vaginal canal, that's not uh, actually outside of the body. It, it's it, it's not outside. It's actually, it's just very low, very low. Okay, got, it, got it. Yes. So she does not endorse anything she does feel a bulge. She does feel a bulge. So that that the rectocele is causing this bulge, as you can imagine, right? And there's pelvic floor descent. So there's a there's a difference between prolapse versus descent. My surgical colleagues have made very clear. You only call it prolapse if it's coming out of the body, okay. like if it's evaginated, like through one of the orifices, right? So through the mm -hmm. anal orifice or vaginal, uh, through the entritus. If it comes out, then they call it a prolapse. If it's not outside, if it hasn't evaginated, then it's a descent. And this is where the radiology literature gets really confusing because we say pelvic floor prolapse all the time, but it's not actually prolapse, like according to our surgeons. So we have to use the right terms that make sense for our surgical colleagues. What's, was that a question? Oh, no, no, sorry. It's just picking up some of the dictation in the background. Oh, gotcha. Okay. So then... Then the last step is they evacuate. So she she goes, she's trying right now. You can see that? You, she's bearing down, trying to evacuate. Nothing comes out. Yep. Nothing comes out. So she has a, 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 a rectocele, like an anterior rectocele, mass effect, there's pelvic floor descent. And then, so she says she has to splint. Uh, and I'm like, okay, then go ahead and splint. Splint and show me what you do when you go. And so she splints. Here's the next step. So splinting. Um, that is the process of putting 
like the patients, you see how it's bulging out, right? So the patient puts their finger in the perineum and they press on it, right? So it's an external pressure that essentially decompresses, mechanically decompresses the rectus seal. See that? And so she splints, she's splitting, splinting, and, and then she's able to now empty almost completely. See that? Yeah, you can see her hand in the front. Yep, front yep. And that's how she's able to. So a couple of teaching points. Um, number one, when is it a surgical versus a non-surgical case? So this is a, right, this is clearly causing, um, it's retaining, right? Like the typical pressure and mechanisms to like evacuate is no longer intact because of a combination of, a large rectus seal as well as pelvic floor descent. And so she, and you can see, she has to manually essentially evacuate, right? Through splinting. Um, so the surgeons, they don't correct it unless it's like coming out. So they have a clinical score that they use uh, that measures the actual externalization. So the rectum, the, the rectal seal, it comes out of the vagina and it comes out. Uh, so they, they have a, a grading scale depending on how far below it is relative to the vagina. Um, so we don't use that. Um, uh, and so anyways, it, they only do it if it's like almost nearly externalized. If it's not like this is not externalized, it just has mass effect. They won't correct it because the outcomes don't, they don't do as well, uh, compared to those that are kind of pretty severe. Mm -hmm. Um, so if it does come out like through the vagina, then they can go in and uh, resect the redundant tissue. Uh, there's a couple of surgical approach they can use uh, to try to remove this kind of outpouching. Okay, so with this is really like, so physical therapist, there's pelvic floor physical therapists uh, that patients can meet with and then the, they teach them how to splint. So this patient already does it. Uh, they teach them various mechanisms to kind of improve the pelvic floor musculature and strengthen it, biofeedback, things like that to conservatively manage their defecation issues. That was a great review and great, um, yeah, great example of multiple findings um, on your fluoro defecogram. Okay, I'm gonna, okay. So first of all, um, what is all this metallic artifact? What does this patient have in their heart? As a left ventricular assist device. Yes, excellent. So we can see uh, that it's basically pumping blood like from the ventricle through this outflow channel right here, which you should look at. Um, it can, you know, develop thrombus within it, but it, this little lining along the outside is normal, so that's not thrombus. Um, that's just normal lining there. Um, but you should look at that, make sure it's clean. And then um, we've got our drive line, which is this metallic thing going through the skin. And what do you guys think about the drive line? It looks like there's some fluid and like um, fast stranding around it. Yeah. Uh, so what are you concerned you, about? Um, oh yeah, I don't, it could just be like post-surgical scar tissue buildup, or if you're concerned about infection, it could be like tunneling from outside to in. Yes, exactly. So there's this term DLI driveline infection. And um, we actually do like, you know, not an insignificant number of um, CTs to look for driveline infection. Um, and this is what you're looking for. So fluid and stranding around the driveline. And then you get concerned that there is, um, there's an infection. Um, okay. So that's one finding. Was somebody trying to say something? No. Okay. Um, okay. That, so, that, so this was concerning for a driveline infection and they're going to see if like there's pus coming out of the skin. In this case, that's what they were concerned about. Okay. Now what, tell me about this kidney. What do you think about this bright blob in the kidney? It, it's not calcium. Yeah, it, it almost looks like there's um I like Yeah, I think it most looks like most likely looks like extravasated contrast. Like it doesn't look like there's any contrast within the collecting system itself. Um right. So okay, so it looks like contrast, it's really, really bright. Um we but we're not in the excretory phase yet of the kidneys. So like, you know, why why would there be really bright contrast there? So you're thinking extravasated contrast, like extravasated IV contrast. So are you thinking like a pseudoaneurysm? 
Oh, that'd be a weird look for it though. Um, it would look more regular if it was extravagant. Yeah, if it was extravasating, like actual just frank extravasation, it would look more irregular. Um, so, you know, the first thing I thought was like, could this be a pseudoaneurysm? It looks really bright. Then, cool. you know, normally pseudoaneurysms in the kidney you get after renal biopsy. I looked to see if they've had a renal biopsy. They had not. Um, somebody mentioned calcification, which is always a good thought when you have something that's really bright. But this was a month ago. And I'll show you there was no calcium in this thing, but it was there. So there was this thing on the non-contrast a month ago, no calcification. And now um, a month later, it looks like this. And, but the other weird thing is that it looks much, much brighter than the aorta, right? And normally pseudoaneurysms can follow, like will follow the aorta. Um, so we were still really perplexed by this. And then actually I'm gonna show you another interesting thing. So, okay, so this is really interesting. This was a recent renal ultrasound where you can see the lesion again. So it's a real lesion. And they put flow on it and there was no apparent flow in it. So then now my theory about the pseudoaneurysm doesn't really make sense because pseudoaneurysm should have like yin yang flow in it, unless it's thrombosed. But if it's thrombosed, then why does it look so bright on my CT? So I'm gonna tell you, there is an answer here. It's a tricky one, but any guesses? Do you have the coronal? Yep. Do you have the pre? I don't have a pre, but I have a recent non-con where nothing. Yes. Is oh, okay. So, so it's new. There's nothing there. Well, it, no, no, no. There's like a, there's like a hypodense lesion in this area. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Um, pa patient hasn't, I was like, well, the other, okay. I, I don't think it is, but like calyceal diverticulum, um, a stone, but you said it was non-dense. Um, yes, it's so not dense like a stone. And then, so I, so, so I will tell you in the end this, we think that this is a calyceal diverticulum and the reason that but it the has, wiser contrast is it excreted contrast from a prior injection. Yes. You got oh, it. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. I'm so like, yeah. they had a CTA of their chest one, uh, you know, less than 24 hours prior. So basically, even though on this, we're not yet excreting this contrast, that excreted contrast just like collected within the calyceal diverticulum and did not leave. Yeah, and the like the cortex is thinned uh, in that region. Eh? Yeah, uh, so you can see that is there's like you know it's just thinned out cortical thinning. Yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. chronic. Whatever it is. Yeah. So and it has a layering. It has a layering density on the axial. So, um, I really liked initially what you said. Like, there's a layering density right yep. there. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like the very first thought I had was calyceal tick, but then I'm like, oh, we're not in the excretory phase, so that's impossible. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. I, and then when you said we had no prior i'm like oh then the patient hasn't had any recent contrast injection yeah 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 they had not think about chest yeah yeah cool okay stop uh this is a patient with well i'm gonna withhold history for now You guys see anything? So we're looking at the three compartments of the pelvis. So the yes. black and the urethra is the anterior compartment. Then the vagina. It looks like a vagina um, with no uterus. So uterus is absent. And that's yep. the middle compartment. And then the posterior compartment is the rectum anus. So residents, do you guys see anything abnormal in one of them? Here, let me give you the axial. Uh, Sorry, this wasn't done here. Ah. Bummer, but it's okay. What do you guys think about that area of the urethra? Here, if it helps, I, we, this is like we didn't. It was like I, it's it's not an abdominal protocol, but but the bindings are there. Extra What? Sorry. You say louder. So like smudgy intermediate T2 signal that's like along the posterior aspect of their uh, the urethra, almost like a diverticulum. This? This? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Just the posterior? What do you think about the anterior? So the urethra is a muscle, right? It's mostly muscle. Um, and so it should be dark like muscle. Uh, so like here, we can look at the anterior abdominal wall. Uh, it's a muscle. Um, so what do you think about the signal 
intensity of the urethra. So this, uh, it's like intermediate gray. It yeah. Be, it's occupying lesion within the urethra. Good. Yes. So this is, um, I think what I think likes to call evil gray. Yeah. So here's your evil gray right there. Right. So actually, now scroll up a couple or down where you can see the. And there's an ulceration. Go ahead. Go up a couple. Up, you said down, 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 down. Right there. Stop right there. Okay, right there. You can actually see the half, half, like on the. Oh yes, yes. You Go can ahead. see the normal, like targetoid appearance on um, screen right over there. Exactly. So that's the normal, like submucosa and, and muscular layer of the urethra, where you can see this, like normal zonal anatomy. And then on the other side, it's all blurry and and blurred out by this tumor. And then if you go up from there, that like you see more and more of like that blurry gray stuff right there. Yeah, all of that is tumor. And you see um, there, if it's distal to, um, you know, urethra, it's squamous cell and proximal, it's urethelial. And what, do you know what this one is? Yes, I do. This was clear cell. Oh. Clear cell urethral cancer. Yes. And so clear cell urethral cancers, like Arthi said, it's usually squamous, right? It's usually squamous. They're the most common urethral uh, subtype. Um, urethral clear cell carcinomas are actually super rare, but it, and it, it happens more often in women, like four to one compared to men. Um, and they can cause obstructive urinary tract symptoms, uh, you know, if, if, if it gets obstructive. In this case, this patient also has a complication that's starting to fistulize. And we'll see on subsequent imaging that there's like a fistula that forms, malignant fistula that forms or kind of a sinus tract. And um, so anyways, this patient, um, uh, they we can do staging as in, in this case this was like primarily uh local staging uh mr is very good for that uh and it can it is associated with urethral diverticulum uh due to urinary stasis which can lead to inflammation and all these complications um uh yeah any questions Great case. And um, you can see them much better on MR. Um, we often like cannot really see it well on CT. Okay, here's another one for you guys, residents. So we saw some lesions in the spleen. So first of all, if you saw multiple hypodense lesions in the spleen, what are you thinking? Patient has no history, really. What's your differential for this kind of thing? Uh, I can't really hear you, but I heard something about embolic. So embolic, usually we'll see like wedge-shaped perfusion abnormalities. These are more like rounded hypodense lesions. Like, I mean, metastasis has to always yeah. be considered. Uh-huh. And uh, what, what primaries like to met to the spleen? Uh, lung... Definitely lung can do it. Um, it's not that common actually to get splenic mets, but a um, couple of the more common ones are melanoma and then lymphoma, which can be multifocal lesions or just enlargement, diffuse infiltration and enlargement of the sp uh, spleen. So those are two things we think about. Um, okay, so that was one finding. And then the other thing is if they don't have a primary malignancy, um, there's something called literal cell angioma, which is a benign multifocal um, you know, lesions in the spleen, and they tend to be hypoenhancing. So if they have no other history, that's something I sometimes bring up. Okay, so moving on, um, they also had this look to their kidney. What do you think about that? This is a tricky case. Um, let me show you the see if there's coronals. Okay, so this is what the kidney looked like. So it looks kind of very hypo-enhancing, maintaining the contour, very geographic. If I saw this, I would think maybe there's an infarct. Um, there is a little bit of cortical thinning here. Um, so we've got splenic lesions, we've got this in the kidney, and then I'm not a chest radiologist, but they do have some chest findings that scroll slowly through here. So what do you guys think about the mediastinum? We got some heterogeneity enhancing lymph nodes, like subcrinal, precrinal. Exactly. So we've got one right here, precarinal right here, subcarinal. They look kind of hypodense. 
very maybe necrotic or I don't know, very hypodense. So we've got hyalur, mediastinal lymphadenopathy, splenic lesions, renal lesion. What do you guys think? Can you put it together? I'm thinking lymphoma. Okay, great thought. And uh, it wasn't lymphoma, but it's a kind of mildly, you know, similar thing. So do you guys know like uh, the one, two, three sign for, um, for sure. mediastinal lymphadenopathy? Yeah. So like what? bilateral and then um, right paratracheal. Yeah. And when, what disease do you get that in? Sarcoid. Yes. So this was sarcoid. They actually biopsied the kidney and it came back non key and granulomas. Um, and so then it made a lot of sense. Like sarcoid loves the spleen. It also loves the liver. Um, and then it, the one, two, three sign is basically right paratracheal and then bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy, which this patient has. So just remember that, like whenever you guys see lymphadenopathy, don't always jump to lymphoma, like sarcoid is in there. It's called the great mimicker of malignancy. Um, about half of these patients will be asymptomatic. And then the other half will have pulmonary symptoms usually um, because they can also get fibrosis and alveolar involvement. Um, about 50% of patients will also have splenic or liver involvement. We sometimes don't see it because it can be at like the microscopic level, but on autopsy, um, about 50% will have splenic and renal involvement, uh, uh, splenic and liver. And then kidney is a little bit less common, but 15% will also have renal involvement. So anyway, this was just a cute case of sarcoid that was affecting kidney, spleen, and the one, two, three, um, right paratracheal and hyalur lymph nodes. So good for the patient. And um, they did do a PET actually, I'll just show it to you quickly. And doesn't necessarily help because it's not specific, but um, they are hot. That, that doesn't necessarily mean they're malignant. Um, sarcoid nodes can be hot. So you can see those hot mediastinal nodes, the hot um, splenic lesions, and then the hot renal lesion here. Um, and then sarcoid is treated, um, it depends on the stage and how severe it is. Um, when it's more severe and you have pulmonary fibrosis, it's much harder to treat, but in earlier stages, they can treat it with steroids. Patient, patient, this was a study that was done like a decade ago, uh, or maybe more, I don't know, and was treated elsewhere and then came to be evaluated. Uh, and this was prior pre pre treatment pre everything um so what do you think so uh, this is your inner pose here here's your in phase uh, and then this is so your do coronal in phase fact that no, this was a study that was done elsewhere oh so got these, it, got are, it. these are these are all like old uber uber old images um so I'm, I'm, but I, but it has all the relevant findings that I want to show you. Um, yeah. Well, first of all, residents, what, what organ do you think these are coming from, and what, what do you think about these signal intensities? Uh, are these coming from the bilateral kidneys? At least on the coronal, they seem separate from the kidneys to me. So the kidneys are here. So yeah, bilateral adrenals. Good. Okay. Uh, tell me more. Uh, so you have, can I see the in phase again? Uh, yes. Okay. So you have really hyper intense signal on the in phase. It's heterogeneous, but it's bright. And then they drop out significantly on the out of phase. Um, so macroscopic fat. Um, and microscopic fat. Um, so on the topic of your differential, what are you considering? Um, like you'll, you want to consider FIOs, um, which can present right bilaterally. Uh, wait, FIOs, do FIOs have fat? Uh, am I wrong on that? I don't think fields have fat. Do they have? Okay. I, I mean, uh, so what? What? What stuff? They, they generally fat? do not have fat. No. Okay. Uh, so okay. Sorry. Th there's two types of fat here, actually. Um. So you mentioned already there's intralesional fat, and then the other type of fat here. I'm going to give you the T2. Here's your T2, and here's your fat sat T2.
Uh, sorry, they're not lining up. Like here. So if you look at this blob here, and then that area is here, right there on fat set. So they do saturate out. So you have macroscopic fat as well. Yes. Good. Good. Okay. Go ahead. Keep going. Uh, and these are. And then you have PT. A... Oh, okay. So Isn't it nice. You're like, oh, I should you just show me the CT first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so these just AMLs. Um. Uh, so adrenal lesions that contain macroscopic fat diagnostic for myelipomas. So bilateral myelipomas. Um, so angiomyelipomas, if we think about kidneys and in the adrenal glands is myelipomas. Um, so I, when you see this, what's one of the differential considerations that you have to think about? bilateral we we had a case that i think are these fellow presented before um but what's a, a th you know because the patient is large bilateral myelipomas i'm just gonna jump in um, yes jump in. think yes. about congenital adrenal hyperplasia yes yes so, so we have like um which is like the hydroxylate 21 hydroxylase deficiency or something so basically you get hypertrophy of both your adrenal glands and, and adrenal rest tissue in your testicles, which will close. Yes. Yes. That's right. So, um, I don't know if I can show my screen. Um, actually, I, I, so the patient presented and now get, patients getting worked up, um, for congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Uh, so there's two types, uh, that apparently there's classic congenital adrenal hyperplasia, and then there's the non-classic form. Um, and these are just, it's like, here, here is a difference between, I didn't know what the difference was, but oops, just kidding. Um, the, there's a non-classic form, uh, which is like a mutation, uh, another, I mean, but they all essentially like, um, lead to, uh, issues with cortisol, um, production, and then can lead to ginormous, um, myelopomas bilaterally. So, um, you can get adrenal rest, um, like. Art that you mentioned that can also lead to these um, symptoms and or manifestations on imaging. What else are they? That's all I know about it. But um, you can get just hypertrophy of the adrenal glands, but you can also get get this, this sort of myelolipomatous hypertrophy as well. Um, so it's, it it doesn't always look this dramatic or this you know like extensive, um, but when you do see uh, like huge adrenal glands, very hypertrophic, or with this myelolipomatous degeneration, um, think about this congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Um, but usually they're diagnosed as infants, um, but sometimes you know as as adults. Um, one other thing that Nelly, you said when you see macroscopic fat. So two, one thing is we used to call it like bulk fat and intravoxel fat, but they've now standardized the terminology that we're supposed to call it macro and microscopic fat. And um, so the macroscopic fat is the one that sats out, or you might see just drop out at the edges on the India ink on the, on the outer face, whereas microscopic, you'll see like drop out internally um, within it, which usually is a sign of like an adrenal adenoma, renal cell carcinoma, um, clear cell type, et cetera. But one thing, Nelly, I did not know previously, which is that if you have a very small amount of fat in an adrenal nodule, it's actually more likely to be an adenoma. I always thought if there was even a small amount of fat that is diagnostic of a myelolipoma, and it's not true, it's actually more likely to be an adenoma. Michael Corwin has been talking about this at recent radiology. Yes, that's right. And you the, have little dots of macroscopic fat. Yes, and you can see that in an adenoma. I also yeah, and the important Corwin. thing is that adenomas can be hormonally active. So they need to be worked up as an adenoma rather than being like sort of dismissed as like a non-hormonally active myelolipoma. But yeah, that was a great traumatic case. Okay, this is a pretty dramatic case. Um, so residents, there is a, this is a fetal MRI. We can see the fetus here in cephalic position. So head down, uh, we can see some of their organs like the fluid filled lungs, um, et cetera. So anyway, that's the baby. And do you see any other, any abnormal findings? I'm gonna draw your attention to the placenta. There's like placenta percreta. 
<laughs> yes. Is that, good, was good, that good. for me? Sorry. Yeah, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's good. It's good. Yeah, like on the left ladder, like at five o'clock position, is really thinned out. Like you don't even see the myometrium. Well, um, yeah. And actually, the whole then, placenta is like almost looks like it's outside of the myometrium, right? Yes. So this is the yeah. edge of the myometrium here. And so this whole placenta was actually growing out of completely out of the myometrium. We were also concerned about, um, you know, it was interfacing with the bladder. We said like, we don't see it definitely invading the bladder, but it's like heavily interfacing with the bladder. Um, it has all these abnormal T2 signals within it. So whenever you have abnormal placentation, a couple of the signs are like having dark T2 bands as well as like extra flow voids. A normal placenta will have blood vessels in it, but when you see like more of these dark areas and bands, uh, we get concerned. And then especially when it's going out like this. So I'll just show you a couple of different other views. Oops, not this one. Let's see if I can, okay. You know, we're getting some loss of signal because there's a lot going on here. But anyway, th here we can see the the placenta like complete, kind of completely going out of the myometrium here. And it's actually encasing these iliac, the iliac artery right here. So we were concerned about that. Okay, so they um, went for an emergency section, and um, when they went in to do the C-section, they basically saw that there was a complete percreta of the placenta. It was adhered to the, like, there was all these dense adhesions. It was inseparable from the bladder, so it looked like it was invading the bladder, and it was encasing some of these um, iliac vessels. Um, so they did the emergency section, and then, um, and then they did a uterine artery embolization because there was a lot of blood, and they wanted to decrease the vascularity to the, to the placenta. So um, IR came in and did a uterine artery embolization, and then they were going to basically do a delayed um, resection uh, because they needed to get sort of more people involved, like um, gyne onc involved to try to, and vascular surgery to try to like separate out this placenta. Um, but uh, like, you know, a day later, um, the patient was bleeding a lot. So they did another MRI. And you can see that actually, so now there's no more baby in, or fetus in here. Um, they, they, the fetus did fine, actually. Um, was, you know, the, the, they did a C-section, fetus is doing okay. Um, but when, you know, they were cutting through this, this whole area, basically it ended up causing sort of this rupture of the uterus. And then the other thing that was kind of crazy is if you look down here, there is blood herniating down like through the sac. So there was like part of the amniotic sac was still intact. And there was actually like blood um, in this sac that was herniating out of the patient right here. So, and that's what they saw on physical wow. exam. I'm, I'm surprised they didn't do a hysterectomy. Like uh, they wanted uh, to do a hysterectomy at the time, but it was just too complicated. They were worried oh. that they're going to cause like catastrophic bleeding because there was like this, this placenta was like attached to so many things. Um, so anyway, from, uh, you know, now they went back with all of the extra help and they did, they did a hysterectomy and um, were able to remove the placenta, preserve the vessels um, and, ever, and and the patient's doing fine. So wow. just an interesting case. Sometimes it's not as clear when you have a placental abnormality, but in this case, it was really clear that it was definitely going beyond uh, the uterus. Uh, so the patient presented with pain, dysmenorrhea, um, had a recent removal of malposition IUD, uh, and uh, yes, I'll just stop there. Here's our... Wait, sorry, you said they had a malpositioned IUD. That was removed. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because I do see some dark thing in the cervix right there, a lin linear thing, but I didn't know if that was like part of the IUD right there. Oh, no, it shouldn't be. Okay. Um. Yeah, I don't see it on the SAG. Okay. Yeah, I think maybe it's just a vessel or uh, an artifact. I don't know. It looks pretty real though, doesn't it, on the axial? <laughs> yeah, but you should be able to see it in multiple planes. Yeah. Um. One thing I'm seeing on the SAG was like it, is there something in the torus of the uterus, like where it's touching the rectum? Uh, so here's, I'd like to see the torus yeah. on the sagittal. Yeah, it feels like right there. It's like, it's like, 
Yes. Tell me, tell me more. That's the rectum was like, or the sigma colon is like pulled in and tethered to the torus or which is like the uterus cervical junction of the uterus. And then actually the, show me the junctional zone. I feel like I can't really see it on the sag. Like, um, junctional zone is right there. It's, it's, it's expanded. So like, and I mean, I would probably like, there's probably two thesis six stuff. Yeah. So I'm thinking right adenomyosis there. of the uterus and then probably some deep infiltrating endometriosis pulling in that sigmoid colon right there. Yeah. So that's, so we call, and yeah, so the, the, the right as, as Arthi had mentioned there, and then the uterus sacral ligaments, you know, that's the most common side of deep infiltrating endometriosis. Um, so we called it thick in there on the left, definitely on the left. And then the area where it was touching the sigmoid, um, this area right there, uh, we called that you know, perhaps there's something there that's a budding. Um, so the patient went to the OR and it was all negative. No uterus sacral ligaments were normal bilaterally, nothing touching the sigmoid. Um, there's nothing there. And like, I'm, I'm showing this case as an example of um, limitations of MR, right? And why deep, deep infiltrating endo is so hard. <laughs> Wait, what <laughs> oh, was their yeah. symptoms? Um, patient of dysmenorrhea. Mm. But they still, do you still think they have adenomyosis? Like when you say it was negative. Did oh, they I'm sorry. Negative for deep infiltrating endo. Oh, Not it. negative for adeno. Um, the the yes it was negative so they didn't do a hysterectomy so we we don't know if, if there was adeno or not it certainly looks suspicious for adeno um uh but the deep end there was no deep endo yeah so i don't really know what to make of it you know because i'm like even knowing the surgical findings i would still call it <laughs> I, I didn't read this study but i agree with the person that read the study um you know it's that's not normal. And that's, the, this is an area that's typically easy to see operatively. I mean, for sure. Like sometimes you can have deep endo that's kind of deep in deep, like for example, rectal vaginal septum, they don't really dissect down here. So if there is endo there, they certainly can be overlooked. Um, so, but this, this area is, is well within the operative view. Uh, so it's, it's not like not, not something that's not accessible to their, you know, to their typical uh, search. So I don't know. I don't know. I was, you know, like the gyne or gynecologists were a little disappointed um, that the findings were negative and we reviewed this case and I don't know what to make of it, but. I, don't I will know say it's not as dramatic as many of the cases you show with like the mushroom cap sign. Yeah, like, that's really right. Invading the, invading that's right. The colon, but yeah. I don't Whenever know. you see mushroom cap sign or the dumpling sign, it's always like there's a very high PBV very, very high. But when you go into this gray area where you don't see those findings, right? Like there's, the yield is not as great. Um, so th that's, that was my takeaway from this case was, you know what, the, if there's deep endo, the finding is going to be real. Like you'll see your mushroom cap. If it's just a budding it now, like I, I don't even, call, I would, I just say this is a buttment. I don't make a big deal out of it now because and now, now oftentimes- I'm the sigmoid just falls off like it, but because all the structures are there, you know, it's maybe the redundant tissue. I don't know the overlapping tissue, but I use the word abutment now rather than the word tethering because we, we've called so many cases where we say tethering, which suggests that there's adhesions or there's invasion uh, when, and then operatively it just falls right off. Like there's nothing. Yeah. I guess um, in retrospect, like the, that thickening of the uterosacral ligament too, like I guess anything could could have caused that. Like maybe the patient had a prior hemorrhagic cyst that ruptured and then like you got a little bit of fibrosis there and, you know. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing about the uterosacral ligament is I, it's something that is seen. It's like they, they can look, they, they they search for that, right? And they they dissect this out. And so like for me, if, if, if you miss something in the uterosacral, it's not a big deal, right? Because it's part of their search. Um, what is not part of their search is the typical, like the invasion, right? Or the, if there is like deep endo invading the bowel, how extensive it is, the depth, the distance, the multifocality. So yeah, I don't, I, I now I don't really worry too much about um, structures that are within their search pattern. So I'm, I'm more attuned to things like the bladder or bowel 
where they really need kind of MR to help guide their surgical approach. Thanks. Nice.